It's an honor for me uh, to introduce to you Professor Robert P. George. Uh, it might be presumptuous, but I consider him a true friend, and it's an honor to be uh, a friend. Um, he is a friend of BYU, a friend of the Wheatley Institution, and a friend of good causes. Uh, we're so happy that he would make uh, the arrangements and make the sacrifices necessary to uh, be with us this evening. Professor George holds Princeton's McCormick Chair in Jurisprudence and is the founding director of the James, James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton. He has also uh, amassed considerable public service in, over the years. He's currently chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. He, is, uh, he has served on the President's Council on Bioethics and as a presidential appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He has served uh, also in uh, positions in, the, in uh, UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology. He was uh, a former judicial fellow of the Supreme Court of the United States, where he received the uh, Justice Tom C. Clark Award. He is the author of several books and articles uh, of the highest quality. Some of his books include uh, In Defense of Natural Law, Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties and Public Morality, one of the ones that's been particularly inf influential for me, The Clash of Orthodoxies, Law, Religion, and Morality in Crisis, Conscience and Its Enemies, Confronting the Dogmas of Liberal Secularism, and most more recently, uh, he and uh, some co-authors, former students, uh, produced What is Marriage? Man, Woman, a Defense, and a follow-up volume, Conjugal Union, What Marriage Is and Why It Matters. His scholarly articles have appeared in such journals as the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, the Columbia Law Review, the American Journal of Jurisprudence, and the list goes on and on. He's received many national and international awards, and uh, I count at least five differently named honorary doctorates uh, here. He's a graduate of Swarthmore College and Harvard Law School. He received a master's degree in theology also from Harvard and a doctorate in philosophy of law from Oxford University. He's a well-known public speaker. He is a man of influence, and I can assure you it is influence for good. It's an honor to have him with us, and I introduce now Professor Robert George. I'm honored that... President Worthen and Sister Worthen are uh, here. Thank you very much for coming out this evening uh, to uh, hear me. We, we actually need you to uh, fill out the seats this evening. Last night, the house was packed. Of course, I was talking about sex. So tonight, uh, <laughs> the topic may be a little less uh, uh, engaging, but it's an important one, the topic of uh, religious liberty. And I want to go to the root. I want to give you a philosophical presentation uh, on the nature and basis of religious liberty. What is it? Whatever its scope and limits, we'll get to that toward the end. Why should we believe in such a thing as a right to religious liberty? Is it the sort of thing we believe in because uh, it's a deal that we make with each other, uh, a modus vivendi, uh, a social contract? I won't interfere with your religious liberty if in return you don't interfere with my religious liberty? Or is there really a moral basis, not a mere contractual one? a moral basis for respecting people's religious liberty and expecting, indeed demanding, that others respect our religious liberty. Well, I think there is. And I want to put before you this evening an account of the reasons I think we should affirm such a doctrine. I won't be a, a, a appealing to faith, to revelation, to religious authority, although many traditions of faith, including yours and including mine, uh, reinforce what reason has to teach us on the nature and basis of religious liberty by proposing that it is indeed God's will that we respect each other's uh, religious uh, freedom. But I won't be making this evening a theological argument. 
I want to make an argument purely on the basis of reason. I want to argue this out at the level or on the plane on which people of faith can engage with those who do not have faith, who are not uh, believers, what's sometimes called a natural law uh, argument. So, before launching into my formal presentation, I have to uh, do three things. Give you um, an apology, a warning, and a promise. I hereby apologize to you uh, for what I'm about to warn you about. <laughs> and what <laughs> the warning is, I warn you that the first paragraph of my presentation is going to be very abstract and difficult to understand. A few of you who are uh, trained as philosophers or studying philosophy, uh, and uh, maybe a few who have read uh, my own uh, philosophical writings, will have some idea maybe of what I'm talking about. <laughs> for others, it will be a bit obscure. So that's my warning, and I apologize for it. My promise is I will make it all clear in the end. If I fail, you can sue me, because I, I'm laying that out as a, as a promise. And by staying in your seats, after the first paragraph, you are detrimentally relying on my promise. And as the lawyers know, detrimental reliance is a very solid alternative to contract, and it will serve just as well as a contract. So I consider that I have a contract with you, or the equivalent, uh, to uh, actually make plain what sounds in the beginning very, very abstract. So let's see if we can make it through the first paragraph, and then I'll assure, I assure you it's going to be smooth sailing from there on out. Okay. Here we go. The starting points of all ethical reflection, all reflection about whether I ought to do something or ought not to do it, whether something's right or wrong, the starting points of all ethical reflection are those fundamental and irreducible aspects of the well-being and fulfillment of human beings that some philosophers, including me, refer to as basic human goods. These goods, these aspects of our well-being and fulfillment, the pursuit of intellectual knowledge, the sort of thing we're doing this evening, engaging each other in friendship, acquiring skills in chess or ballet or football, uh, trying to lead a virtuous life, all these are the basic aspects of human well-being and fulfillment, and as such, these goods, these basic human goods, friendship, knowledge, the development of skill, integrity, these goods, as more than merely instrumental reasons or purposes, that is, things that we want for their own sake and not merely for what they can get us, not for the sake of something else to which they are mere means, these goods are the subjects of what St. Thomas Aquinas, following his great teacher Aristotle, uh, called the very first principles of practical reason. These are the principles that control all rational thinking about ethics, all rational thinking about what we ought to do or not do, all rational thinking with a view to acting, whether the acts performed are in the end morally good or morally bad, whether we reach the right conclusions or not, whether we live by the right conclusions or not. Our reasoning will always begin because it can only begin from these starting points about what is actually humanly valuable or well-being, uh, uh, or fulfilling. Uh, the things that uh, give us reason to want anything in the first place. The first principles of practical reason direct our cho choosing toward what is rationally desirable because humanly fulfilling and therefore intelligibly available to choice in the first place and away from their privations. It is in the end the integral directiveness of these principles, that is the directiveness of these principles taken all together, that provides the criterion or when specified the set of criteria, that is to say the moral norms, by which it is possible rationally to distinguish right from wrong, what is morally good from what is morally bad, including what is just and what is unjust. Morally good choices are choices that are in line with the various fundamental aspects of human well-being and fulfillment integrally conceived, conceived as a whole. Morally bad choices are choices that are not, 
choices that are not in line with our integral well-being. Okay. Everybody survive? We're all okay? Good. Now, to say these very abstract things that I've been saying is simply to spell out philosophically the point made by Martin Luther King in his famous letter from the Birmingham jail about just and unjust laws, laws that honor people's dignity and rights and laws that violate them. Now, you'll perhaps recall, certainly those of you who've read the letter will recall, that the great civil rights champion anticipated a challenge to the moral goodness of the acts of civil disobedience that landed him behind bars in Birmingham. He anticipated critics asking him, in the letter itself, he anticipates his critics saying, how can you, Dr. King, engage in willful law breaking when you yourself had stressed the importance of obedience to law when you demanded that officials of the southern states conform to the Supreme Court's desegregation ruling in the case of Brown against the Board of Education just a few years earlier. King took that as a serious challenge. And here is his response, and I'll quote him at some length here. The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of law, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate the obeying of just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? This is still King going on. How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts the human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority." Unquote. Now, I'll pause for a moment because I can't resist uh, sharing with you um, just how much fun you can imagine how much fun I have with that long quotation from Dr. Martin Luther King with my colleagues at Princeton and elsewhere. Law of God, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, eternal law. Yeah. <laughs> and they can't say a thing in reply. <laughs> so just laws, King tells us, elevate and ennoble the human personality, or what King in other contexts refers to as the human spirit. Unjust laws debase and degrade it. Now his point about the morality or immorality of laws is a good reminder that what's true of what sometimes are called, uh, is called personal morality is also true of political morality. The choices and actions of political institutions at every level like the choices and actions of individuals, can be right or wrong, morally good or morally bad. They can be in line with human well-being and fulfillment in all its manifold dimensions, what I've been calling integral human well-being and fulfillment, or they can fail in any of a range of ways to respect the integral flourishing of human persons. In many cases, the failure of laws, policies, and institutions to fulfill the requirements of morality, we speak intelligibly and rightly in these cases of a violation of human rights. This is particularly true where the failure is properly characterized as an injustice, failing to honor people's equal worth and dignity, failing to give them or actively denying them even what they are due. But, contrary to the teaching 
of a very, very influential stream of contemporary liberal thought, whose leader was the great, uh, late, alas, uh, Harvard political philosopher John Rawls. Contrary to this teaching, I want to suggest that we need to know about the human good before we can determine what rights people have. Rawls, in the stream of political philosophy of which he was the most influential exponent, argued that for purposes of political philosophy at least, the right is prior to the good. We need to figure out what rights people have independently of any understanding or belief about the human good. Since, after all, questions of what makes for or detracts from a valuable and morally worthy way of life are highly disputed questions, questions upon which people dramatically disagree. So Rawls embraced what he labeled an anti-perfectionist approach to political philosophy, an approach according to which government could never legitimately constrain liberty on the basis of controversial ideas about what makes for or does detract from a valuable and morally worthy way of life. I want to argue that is completely wrong, indeed backwards. That actually the good is prior to the right in the sense that we cannot figure out what rights people have or the shape of our rights unless we understand the goods that the whole intelligible point of rights is to protect. We have certain rights because they protect certain aspects of our well-being and fulfillment, the human good. So here's what I mean. To be sure, human rights, including the right to religious liberty, the right that we're gathered this evening to discuss, are among the moral principles that demand respect from all of us, including from governments and international institutions. To respect people, to respect their dignity, is to, among other things, honor their rights, including, to be sure, the right to religious freedom. Like all moral principles, however, human rights, including the right to religious liberty, are shaped and given content by the human goods they protect. Rights, like other moral principles, are intelligible as rational action-guiding principles because they are entailments and, at some level, specifications of the integral directiveness or prescriptivity of the principles of practical reason that direct our choosing toward what is humanly fulfilling and enriching, or as to what Dr. what Dr. King had in mind when he said uplifting of the human spirit, and away from what is contrary to our well-being as the kind of creatures we are, namely human persons. And so, for example, it matters to the identification and defense of the right to life, a right violated not only when the death of another is sought as one's end or as a means to one's end, but also in cases in which someone's death is a foreseen and accepted, unfairly accepted, I should say, a foreseen and unfairly accepted side effect of one's action in pursuit of an end. It matters that human life is no mere instrumental good and no mere means to something else, but is rather an intrinsic aspect of our good as human persons, an integral dimension of our overall flourishing. Think about what we are, we human creatures. We're rather complex critters. We can flourish or decline, flourish or fail to flourish, in a range of different dimensions. One of those is biological. As animals, albeit rational animals, but as biological organisms, we can be healthy, strong, in good shape, or we can be dilapidated, uh, sickly, uh, having a lot of back trouble as I have in the moment, which is why I'm in this chair. You can be in better or worse shape. You can flourish or fail in some respect or another to flourish in respect of our biological health, because our biological health is one intrinsic fundamental aspect of our overall well-being. It's not the only one. We can flourish or fail to flourish intellectually. We can be bright, astute, on the bowl, attentive, informed, 
critical in our thinking and judging, not just prepared to accept the last thing some lecturer said or the first thing you read this morning in the newspaper, but actually engage in critical judgment. Or we can fail to flourish. We can be dull-witted, inattentive, uncritical in our thinking, ready to believe the last thing anybody tells you. So we can flourish or fail to flourish in that respect. And, and that's only the beginning. We can flourish or fail to flourish in respect of our lives as social creatures. Man, as Aristotle taught, is a social animal. We can be rich in friendships and good family relationships. We can be loved and we can love. We can be people who will the good of others, who delight in their achievements, who take joy in the good things that happen to others. We can be about like old Mr. Fezziwig in, uh, in uh, Charles Dickens' wonderful story, A Christmas Carol. Or we can fail to flourish in respect of what we can be like the other character in A Christmas Carol, old Ebenezer Scrooge, who before the, the, um, the ghostly visitors came to straighten him out, he was mean-spirited, uh, took no delight in the joy of others, uh, didn't care about his fellow man, uh, Bah humbug was his uh, favorite expression. Uh, we can flourish or we can fail to flourish. Or how about moral character? Unlike the brute animals who cannot judge each other or themselves based on morality, uh, you know, the, uh, the lion will take down the impala without deliberating about whether that's a morally good thing to do. We human beings aren't like that. Again, as rational animals, as moral creatures, we can be virtuous, people of good character, people who will the good, not only for ourselves but also for others, people who are fair in our dealings with others, people who respect our fellow man and honor God. Or we can be the other way. In all of these various dimensions, we can flourish or fail to flourish. In respect of all of these goods of human existence, we can flourish or fail to flourish. And one of them, of course, is our biological reality. That's what's protected by the right to life. But what about religion? Does it protect a human good? If there's a right to freedom of religion, it must be, if I'm right, if my thesis is right, the thesis I've laid before you, it must be because there's some good that, or set of goods that it protects. But to get there, and of course I will argue that there in fact is, to get there we're going to first have to ask that question that the Supreme Court refuses to answer. In case after case after case, when it decides religious liberty issues, or issues concerning the establishment, the, the non-establishment of religion clause of the First Amendment. The Supreme Court deals with religion, but always says they're not going to define what religion is. They're not going to say what religion is. I'm actually going to really take a radical um, risk this evening, and I'm actually going to try to do what the Supreme Court says it can't do. I'm going to define, I'm going to tell you what religion is. Ready for this? In its fullest and most robust sense, Religion is the human person's being in right relation to the divine, the more than merely human source or sources, if there be such, of meaning and value. Now, of course, even the greatest among us in the things of the spirit, the greatest, even they, fall short of spiritual perfection in various ways. Uh, Mother Teresa was just uh, made a saint of the of the Catholic Church, and, she, and she's recognized as saintly by people of all uh, uh, faiths. But, but we know that from, from her diaries that she herself considered herself as falling short in many spiritual dimensions. So even the most spiritual of us fall short. But in the ideal of perfect religion, each of us would understand as comprehensively and deeply as possible the body of truths about spiritual things, and would fully order his or her life and share in the life of a community of faith that is ordered in line with those spiritual truths. In the perfect realization of the good of religion, 
one would achieve the relationship that the divine, say God himself, assuming for the sake of argument uh, for the moment the truth of monotheism, wishes us to have with him. The trouble is, of course, there are many, many different traditions of faith, and the different traditions of faith have different views of what constitutes religion in its fullest and most robust sense. They could all agree with my definition, I think, but as to the content, as to what the spiritual truths are, which community or communities have lined themselves up fully with spiritual truth, well, there, the different traditions are going to disagree. There are different doctrines, different scriptures, different structures of authority, different ideas of what's true and good, different ideas about what's true of spiritual things and what it means to be in proper relationship to the more than merely human sources of meaning and value that different traditions understand as divinity. Now, for my part, just speaking for myself here, I believe that reason, the intellect, the mind, has a very large role to play for each of us in deciding where spiritual truth most robustly is to be found. And by reason here, I mean not only our capacity for moral reasoning and moral judgment, but also our capacities for understanding and evaluating claims of all sorts, logical claims, historical, scientific, and so forth. So I think that uh, if, I, if someone were asking me for advice about the religious quest, I would say, well, you know, any claims that are made to you by someone representing any particular faith, whether it's LDS, whether it's Catholic, whether it's Muslim, uh, whatever it is, use your intellect to evaluate the different claims. And some of those claims will be historical, and some of those claims will be logical, and some of those claims uh, uh, will be of all sorts of different types. So I think there's a high role for reason. Now, other people don't think that. Other religious people don't think that. There, there are the Kierkegaardian Christians who are at the opposite extreme from me, who believe it's really not so much reason as a leap of faith. And then there are lots of people in between. So if I'm at one extreme and Kierkegaard's at the other extreme, there are lots of people on a spectrum in between. But we need not resolve whether I'm right or Kierkegaard's right or anybody in this, on the spectrum in between is right in order to, I think, agree with me about this. And that is that there really is a basic human good of religion, a good that is uniquely architectonic in shaping one's pursuit of and participation in all the basic human goods, all the aspects of human well-being and fulfillment. And that one begins, begins to realize and participate in this good, the good of religion, from the moment one begins the quest the honest quest to understand the more than merely human sources of meaning and value and to live authentically and with integrity by ordering one's life in line with one's best judgments of the truth in religious matters. So before we've ever gotten to the question of who's ultimately right, who's nearest the truth, which uh, ecclesiastical body or religion uh, has the greatest share of the truth. Before we even get there, I want to argue that someone begins to realize the human good of religion, this aspect of our well-being and fulfillment, as soon as the individual starts raising the questions, launches the quest, begins to ask what the truth is because that person wants to know what's true about God or the gods or what's out there, if anything. So even Albert Camus, I believe, though he ends up in unbelief, is participating in the good of religion when he begins to ask those fundamental existential questions. Now, from my point of view, he's far from the fullness of truth. He's far from religion in its most robust and fullest sense. But he's already participating in something humanly valuable and fulfilling. In fact, what would we think of a person who led a life so superficial and trivial that they never even wondered about those questions? That the question of religion, the question of whether there is anything out there, whether there's any fundamental meaning or value in human life, a person who never asked what's it all about, 
that, that person would be a human being and would have full human dignity, but he really wouldn't even be beginning to lead a fully human life. Our humanity itself impels us to ask these questions and to try honestly to answer them and to live authentically in line with our best judgments, as Camus tried to do. Well, if I'm right, then, the existential raising of religious questions, the honest identification of answers, and the fulfilling of what one sincerely believes to be one's duties in light of those answers are all parts of the human good of religion, a good whose pursuit is an indispensable feature of the comprehensive flourishing of a human being. If I'm right, then, man is indeed a homo religiosus, a, a religious by nature creature. And if that's true, then respect for a person's well-being, a person's good, a person's flourishing, or more simply, respect for the person, because to respect a person means to respect that person's well-being, demands respect for his or her flourishing as a seeker of spiritual religious truth, and as a man or woman who lives in line with his or her best judgments of what is indeed, in fact, true in spiritual matters. And that, in turn, requires respect for the person's liberty in religious matters, in the religious quest. Now, because faith of any type, including certainly religious faith, cannot be authentic, it cannot be faith unless it's free, respect for the person, that is, respect for his or her dignity as a free and rational creature, requires respect for his or her Liberty, that's pretty straightforward, right? The, the law can, can coerce, or even a bully can coerce the outward manifestations of religious faith, right? A, a bully could, could make someone go to church. He could say, you know, I'm going to beat you up unless you go to church. Uh, an evil government could force someone not to go to church. We want you to manifest the faith of communism, which is atheistic. But what governments and bullies can't reach are the interior acts of reason and will that are the substance of faith. You can't coerce faith. It's not just that you shouldn't. It's that you can't. It's a metaphysical impossibility. And it's immoral to try. You can coerce, as I say, the outward acts that a person would perform if a person had faith, but not the faith itself. And that's why it makes sense from the point of view of reason. Notice I haven't appealed to authority, to scripture, to, to the fathers of the, of, the, of the ancient fathers of the Christian church, to anything like that. Reason. To understand that religious freedom is a fundamental right. Interestingly and tragically in times past and even in some places today as we know all too well from just reading the news, regard for person's spiritual well-being has been the premise and motivating factor for actually denying religious liberty or conceiving of it in a cramped and restricted way. People who share my premise that we have a very important obligation to respect the religious well-being of people have drawn precisely the opposite conclusion from the one I'm drawing. They have, and I draw the conclusion there is therefore a right to religious liberty. They draw the conclusion that we should therefore coerce people to belong to the true religion, which of course they believe is their religion. They wouldn't believe it unless they believed it was true. Now before the Catholic Church embraced the robust conception of religious freedom that honors the civil right to give public witness and expression to sincere religious views even when the Church regards them as erroneous in the document called Dignitatis Humanae of the Second Vatican Council, some Catholics rejected the idea of a right to religious freedom on the theory that only the truth has rights. That was the slogan of the people who opposed the Catholic Church's decision to embrace a robust conception of religious liberty at the Second uh, Vatican Council. They said only the truth has rights, and um, w one bishop actually led a, um, a schism, a movement uh, under his authority out of the Catholic Church. Uh, mainly because of the church's willingness to embrace a robust conception of religious liberty. But uh, this, was, this was a new development. The church had always had, the Catholic church had always held the view that faith could not be coerced. Now, sometimes in the name of Catholicism, even church officials had engaged in coercive acts. But that was always contrary to the teaching of the church because 
Faith cannot be coerced by nature, metaphysically. Faith cannot be coerced. But what was new was the church embracing the view that religious freedom extends even to the right to propagate teachings contrary to the Catholic faith in a country or in a culture where they could be suppressed. In the, even as late as the 19th century, some church documents, some Vatican documents were expressing grave concern, even condemnation of, quote, religious liberty, unquote, or even democracy, unquote, because they associated those ideas with the French revolutionary ideology of religious liberty. They didn't have a very good understanding of the American alternative. It was, after all, a European-dominated church. So when they heard religious liberty, they saw the Jacobins, the French revolutionaries, the idea that no religion is true, or that all religions are equally true, or that the truth of religion is irrelevant to how people should lead their lives and how societies should constitute themselves, or the belief that religious vows don't bind, or that it's immoral to take religious vows because you're attempting immorally to bind your conscience against future changes of mind. So you can see, if that's your conception of religious liberty, and you're a Catholic, you're going to say, well, I'm not for that. And it was only later, really under the influence of American thinkers like John Courtney Murray, the great Jesuit public intellectual and theologian, John Courtney uh, Murray, uh, who persuaded a European-dominated church that, you know, the American understanding actually doesn't go for all that French European, uh, French revolutionary stuff, that it's possible to have a conception of religious freedom that is not hostile to religion, but on the contrary is friendly to religion and even rooted in a view of the value of religion. Now, the mistake of the people who claimed that, uh, who, who flew under the banner, only the truth has rights, was not in the premise. Religion is a great human good, and the truer the religion, the better for the fulfillment of the believer. People of all faiths would agree on that. They might disagree about which is the truer religion, <laughs> But they would all agree that religion is an aspect of human well-being, and the truer the religion, the deeper the enrichment, the fulfillment. The mistake was not in that premise. The mistake, rather, was in the supposition made by some that the good of religion was not being advanced or participated in in any way outside the context of the one true faith, and that it could reliably be protected and advanced by placing civil restrictions enforceable by agencies of the state on the advocacy of religious ideas. So this was the argument for why it's morally acceptable to shut down, say, Mormon missionaries in a Catholic culture, or evangelical Protestants who are uh, proclaiming Reformation ideals and trying to convert the Catholics. Now, the fathers of the Second Vatican Council rejected this supposition. But in doing it, they did not embrace the idea that error has rights. They noticed, rather, that people have rights, and they have rights even when they are in error. Error doesn't uh, undermine the dignity of the human person or the person's rights. And among those rights, integral to authentic religion as a fundamental and irreducible human good, is the right to express and even advocate in line with one's sense of one's conscientious obligations what one believes to be true about religious matters, even if one's beliefs are in one way or another less than fully sound, and indeed, even if they are false. And it's that insight, I think, if I may say so, Richard, that insight is what has united today a vast range of religions, faiths, in support of religious liberty against the tremendous pressure bearing down on religious liberty from the forces of liberal secularism. And so if we look at the coalition supporting religious liberty, it's Catholics and evangelicals, it's Mormons and Jews, it's Assemblies of God, it's Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, it's Muslims, it's every different tradition of faith. Not everyone within all the different traditions, but in many cases the mainstreams and the official authorities of the religions lining up solidly behind this idea of a right to religious freedom. Again, not as a modus vivendi. People who think that this alliance is just a deal, is just a, 
mutual non-aggression pact don't understand what the religions themselves understand as motivating them. It's rather embracing the idea that it's a moral obligation. I shouldn't force you to join my religion, not because maybe you'll get the upper hand and force me to join yours. Rather, the reason I shouldn't force you to join my religion is that would be a violation of your right. I have every right to try to persuade you. That's an exercise of freedom of religion. But if I'm not trying to persuade you, but rather trying to bully or coerce you, then I'm attacking freedom of religion, violating your dignity. Now, when I have assigned this document of the Second Vatican Council, proclaiming the robust right to religious freedom, which is called dignitatis humanae, human dignity, religious freedom being at the foundation of human dignity. When I've assigned this document in courses addressing the question of religious liberty, I've always stressed to my students, whether they're Catholic or not Catholic, the importance of reading it together with another document of the Second Vatican Council called Nostra Aetate. Whether one is Catholic or not, I don't think it's possible to achieve a rich understanding of the Declaration on Religious Liberty and the developed teaching of the Catholic Church on religious freedom without considering what the Council Fathers proclaim in Nostra Aetate, which is the Declaration on the Non-Christian Religions. <clears throat> now, I, uh, I assign uh, uh, these uh, Catholic religious documents in my secular courses uh, uh, at Princeton often. Uh, for two reasons. One is, of course, the Catholic Church is the largest single religious body uh, in the world, and so what its view is on important issues like religious freedom really matters to the overall politics of the world. And secondly, because it shows how a religious tradition itself has wrestled historically with the question of religious freedom, and a religious tradition that has itself always held that faith and reason are not separate, but are jointly, mutually reinforcing of each other. A, a church that, like me, I guess it's not surprising since I'm a Catholic, a church that gives a high role, assigns a high role to reason in the religious quest. Now, in the Declaration on the Non-Christian Faiths, the Church Fathers pay tribute to all that is true and holy, implying and then explicitly saying that there is much that is good and worthy even in the non-Christian faiths, including Hinduism and Buddhism, and especially Judaism and Islam. In doing so, they give recognition to the ways in which religion, even where it does not include the defining content of what Catholics as Christians have to believe to be religion in its fullest and most robust sense, namely the incarnation of Jesus Christ, enriches, ennobles, and fulfills the human person in the spiritual dimension of his being. And this is to be honored and respected in the view of the Council Fathers because the dignity of the human being requires it. Now naturally, the non-recognition of Christ as the Son of God must count for the Council Fathers as a falling short in the non-Christian faiths, even the Jewish faith, in which Christianity is of course itself rooted and which stands according to Catholic teaching in an unbroken and unbreakable covenant with God, just as the proclamation of Christ as the Son of God must count as an error in Christianity from a Jewish or Muslim perspective. I mean, the law of logic holds in religion as it does everywhere else. Um, <clears throat> if you think that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I think that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, we both can't be right. <laughs> You have to think, I have to think you're in error and you have to think that I'm in error. That doesn't mean we should shoot each other or not be nice to each other. It doesn't mean that we can't learn things from each other, but it means that we disagree and we can't. If I think this is true and you think it's not true, we each think the other's wrong about something. It's okay. It's okay. But the fathers teach this does not mean that Judaism and Islam are simply false and without merit. Just as, by the way, neither Judaism nor Islam teaches that Christianity is simply false and without merit. On the contrary, the Council Fathers teach that these traditions enrich the lives of their faithful in spiritual dimensions, thus contributing to their fulfillment. Now, the Catholic Church does not have a monopoly on the natural law reasoning by which I'm this evening explicating and defending the human right to religious liberty. But the church does have a deep commitment to such reasoning and a long experience 
with it. I, I say the Catholic Church didn't invent it. No Christian faith invented it. If we want to give credit to who invented it, we have to go back to the ancient Greeks and uh, Romans, to the, to the great pagan uh, thinkers. Although, it's interesting, if you've read some of the church fathers, the early church fathers, some of them were so impressed with the wisdom of a figure like Plato that they wondered, some of them even wondered aloud, whether maybe somehow Plato had gotten hold of a manuscript of the Jewish scriptures. Or, or, or one of the fathers uh, speculated about the possibility that God might have given a private revelation of the content of the Hebrew scripture uh, to Plato. But of course, they didn't, in the end, uh, uh, accept that. Uh, the, the superior account is that there is a natural law and that a, that a pure heart uh, and a good mind applied to questions of uh, ethics, uh, including those that religions, of course, uh, have much to say about, uh, can get really very, uh, very far, which we would expect if what Paul teaches uh, in the letter of the Romans is true about a law written on the hearts even of the Gentiles who did not have the law of Moses. But as I say, although the Catholic Church or Christianity didn't invent uh, natural law reasoning, uh, the Catholic Church does have a particularly long record of um, uh, exploring it and deploying it. And in Dignitatis Humanae, the fathers of the Second Vatican Council present a natural law argument for religious freedom. Indeed, they begin by presenting a natural law argument before supplementing it in the second half of the document with arguments appealing to uh, the data of Scripture. Uh, and the authority of the church. So let me ask you to linger with me just a bit longer over these key Catholic texts so that I can illustrate by the teachings of an actual faith how some religious leaders and believers, and not just statesmen concerned to craft national or international policies in uh, circumstances of religious pluralism, uh, have incorporated and can incorporate into their understanding of the basic human right to religious liberty principles and arguments uh, that should appeal to all men and women of sincerity and goodwill. Now, let me quote at some length from Nostra Aetate to give you an appreciation of the rational basis of the Catholic Church's affirmation of the good of religion as a basic human good, as an aspect of human well-being and fulfillment, uh, a good of human nature, as, uh, as uh, uh, my friend uh, who, was, who was just with us, uh, Jay Buzashevsky, would put it. Um, how this good of religion is manifested in various different faiths. Uh, I'll do this in order to show how one faith, uh, in this case Catholicism, can root its defense of a robust conception of freedom of religion in more than a modus vivendi or a mutual non-aggression pact with other faiths or in what the late um, Judith Schlar of Harvard labor labeled a liberalism of fear liberalism of fear, or much less in religious relativism or indifferentism. So, sometimes people make the argument for religious liberty, as the French revolutionaries did, but they didn't much respect it, uh, make the argument for religious liberty uh, by appeal to religious relativism or indifferentism. Religion isn't important, so everybody should do what they want. Or there's no religious truth, so everybody should do uh, what they want. I don't think you have to appeal to those kinds of things. I think you can rather root the value uh, of religious liberty, you can root the right to religious liberty in a rational affirmation of the human worth of religion, the value of religion, the good of religion, as an intrinsic good, not just as an instrumental good. Religion does a lot of instrumental good. But even beyond the instrumental good, there's the intelligible, intrinsic good of religion as I described it to you, that quest to understand religious truth, the honest effort to answer those questions the effort to live with integrity and authenticity and view in line with one's best judgments and not to be a phony or a fake. Uh, so here's what Nostra Aetate has to say. Uh, please excuse the length of this quote, but I think you'll find it most interesting. Throughout history, even to the present day, there is found among different peoples a certain awareness of a hidden power, a power lying behind the course of nature and the events of a human life, or of human life. At times there is present even a recognition of a supreme being, or still more, of a father. This awareness and recognition results in a way of life that is imbued with a deep religious sense. I'll, I'll bracket things here just to interject to say, I think what the fathers have in mind is even what some would call very primitive religious faiths that, that are not the 
uh, the faiths of the great civilizations, but uh, some tribal faiths and traditions that, that have an awareness of something transcendent, uh, a supreme being, a great spirit, uh, even a father. Okay, back to the text. This awareness and recognition results in a way of life that is imbued with a deep religious sense. The religions which are found in the more advanced civilizations, now we move to them, endeavor by way of well-defined concepts and exact language to answer these questions. Thus in Hinduism, men explore the divine mystery and express it in both the limitless riches of myth and the accurately defined insights of philosophy. They seek release from the trials of the present life by ascetical practices, profound meditation, and recourse to God in confidence and love. Buddhism, in its various forms, testifies to the essential inadequacy of this changing world. It proposes a way of life by which men can, with confidence and trust, attain a state of perfect liberation and reach supreme illumination, either through their own effort or by the aid of divine help. So too, the other religions which are found throughout the world and which attempt in their own ways to calm the hearts of men by outlining a program of life covered by doctrine, moral precepts, and sacred rites. The Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. She has high regard for the manner of life and conduct, the precepts and doctrines, which although differing in many ways from her own teaching, nevertheless often reflect truths which enlighten all men. Yet she proclaims and is duty bound to proclaim without fail Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, John 1.6. In him in whom God reconciled all things to himself, 2 Corinthians 5, men find the, fullness, find the fullness of their religious life. The fullness. It goes on. The church therefore urges her sons to enter with prudence and charity into discussions and collaboration with members of other religions. Let Christians, while witnessing to their own faith, acknowledge, preserve, and encourage the spiritual and moral truths found among the non-Christians. The church also has a high regard for the Muslims. They worship God, who is one, living and subsistent, merciful and almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, who has also spoken to men. They strive to submit themselves without reserve to the decrees of God, just as Abraham submitted himself to God's plan, to whose faith Muslims link their own. Although not acknowledging Jesus as God, they revere him as a prophet. His virgin mother they also honor, and even at times devoutly invoke. Further, they await the day of judgment and the reward of God following the resurrection of the dead. For this reason, they highly esteem an upright life, and they worship God especially by way of prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. Over the centuries, many quarrels and dissensions have arisen between Christians and Muslims. This was written in 1965. This, this sacred council now pleads with all, Muslim and Christian, to forget the past and urges that a sincere effort be made to achieve mutual understanding for the benefit of all men. Let them together preserve and promote peace, liberty, justice, and moral values. 1965. Then it goes on. And this is what the document is actually famous for. It's often, in fact, thought of as the Catholic document about the Jewish people. That's what got all the publicity. But all that other stuff is in there as well. But then it turns to the unique and special relationship between Christianity and the Jewish people. So it says, sounding the depths of mystery which is the church, this sacred council remembers the spiritual ties which link the people of the new covenant to the stock of Abraham. The church of Christ acknowledges that in God's plan of salvation, the beginning of her faith and election is to be found in the patriarchs and in Moses and the prophets. She professes that all Christ's faithful, who as men of faith are sons of Abraham, are included in the same patriarch's call, and that the salvation of the church is mystically prefigured in the exodus of God's chosen people from the land of bondage. On this account, the church cannot forget that she received the revelation of the Old Testament by way of that people with whom God in his inexpressible mercy established the ancient covenant. Nor can she forget that she draws nourishment from that good olive tree, that would be the Jewish people, onto which the wild olive branches of the Gentiles have been grafted. 
The church believes that Christ, who is our peace, has through his cross reconciled Jews and Gentiles and made them one in himself, citing Ephesians uh, chapter 2, 14 to 16. Okay, so that's the long quotation from uh, Nostra Aetate, the Declaration on the Non-Christian Religions. Now, of course, from the point of view of any believer, Jewish or Muslim, LDS or Catholic, any believer, the further one gets away from the truth, the truth of faith, in all its dimensions, what the Council Fathers in that passage referred to as the fullness of religious life, the less fulfillment is available. We ought all to try to get the whole truth as much as we possibly can. And we should go where we think the fullness of truth is to be found. If our conscience takes us to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that's where we should be. If our conscience takes us to the Jewish faith, that's where we should be. But that does not mean that even a primitive and superstition-laden faith, much less the faiths of those advanced civilizations, as the fathers say, is utterly devoid of value, or that there is no right to religious uh, liberty for people who practice those faiths. Nor does it mean that atheists have no right to religious freedom. The fundaments of respect for the good of religion require that civil authority respect and in appropriate ways even nurture conditions or circumstances in which people can engage in the sincere religious quest and live lives of authenticity reflecting their best judgments as to spiritual matters. To compel an atheist to perform acts of religion, acts that are premised on, say, theistic belief, which does happen in some parts of the world, is to deny that person the fundamental bit of the good of religion that is his, namely, living with honesty and integrity in line with his best judgments about ultimate reality. That's Camus. That's why I was saying Camus is participating at least in a kind of um, basic way in the human good of religion. If I'm right, if you're right, he hasn't come anywhere near its fullness. But by launching the quest, he's beginning, participating in the good. By trying to live a life with authenticity and integrity, even by declining to perform religious acts just in the hope of getting ahead, pretending to be religious when he's not. Even that authenticity by which he lives in line with his best judgments, even though they're atheistic, is a participation at a very basic level, very elementary uh, level in the good of religion. Coercing him to perform religious acts does him no good, right? Because faith can't be coerced. You're not going to make him holy by making him go to church. So it does no good, since faith must, really must be free, and it dishonors his dignity, which is more fundamental. It dishonors his dignity as a free and rational person, a person who can engage in the religious quest, who can seek with integrity to honor his sincere best judgments about these questions. So the violation of liberty is worse than futile. I, I gave a presentation like this uh, to the uh, political uh, theory group at Yale uh, about a year ago, and uh, I thought I was just being incredibly nice and generous to the atheists. <laughs> and a couple of the atheists room, in the room just shot off like a rocket, claiming that I was trying to turn them into being religious. I was trying to characterize them as, as religious, which proves you can't win. <laughs> now, of course, there are limits, there must be limits to the freedom that must be respected for the sake of the good of religion and the dignity of the human person as a being whose integral fulfillment includes the spiritual quest and ordering one's life in line with one's best judgments as to what spiritual truth requires. Horrible evil, even horrific injustice, can be committed by sincere people for the sake of religion. We know this today all too well. Now, it could be that some of the people who, in the name of Islam, commit these atrocities are not actually religious people. They've got a political agenda. It's some ideological thing, some personal thing, and they're just using Islam as an excuse. There's probably some of that. But that can't explain it all. I mean, it's, and it's not the first time in history. 
honestly, it's true that sometimes religious people, for the sake of religion, do horrible things. It was done in the, sake, in the name of my own religion in the past, perhaps in the name of yours. I don't know. Very few religions are free from moments that they can't be completely proud of in their histories. But we know that grave evils and horrible injustices can be done in the name of religion. They can be done by people who are sincerely seeking to do God's will or to get right with God or the gods or their conception of ultimate reality, whatever it is. The presumption in favor of respecting religious liberty must, for the sake of the human good and the dignity of the human person, uh, be powerful and broad, but it cannot be unlimited. And nobody I know argues that it should be unlimited. Everybody understands that religious liberty, while a profoundly important right, is not a right to which there are no limits. Even the great good, the great end, the great goal of getting right with God cannot justify a morally bad means. It's just the same thing your mother taught you when you were little kids. You know, you shouldn't do something bad even for the sake of something good. The end doesn't justify the means. Remember when your mom said the end doesn't justify the means? You were a teenager, you got up to something, and then you, you rationalize it in terms of some great thing, great thing you were going to make daddy's birthday happier or something. You know, you can't do, the means doesn't just, the end doesn't justify the means. Well, that applies here in this profound area. You can't do bad stuff even for the sake of the true good of uh, religion. I don't doubt the sincerity of the ancient Aztecs in practicing human sacrifice or the sincerity of those in the history of various traditions of faith who used coercion and even torture in the cause of what they believed was religiously required. But these things are deeply wrong. They were then and they are now. And they need not and should not be tolerated in the name of religious freedom. To suppose otherwise is to back oneself into the rather awkward position of supposing that violations of religious freedom and other injustices of equal gravity must be respected for the sake of religious freedom. Still, to overcome the powerful and broad presumption in favor of religious liberty, to be justified in requiring the believer to do something contrary to his faith or forbidding the believer to do something his faith requires, political authority must meet a very high burden, a heavy burden. The legal test in the United States, the one that was argued about yesterday in the Supreme Court in the Little Sisters of the Poor case, the legal test in the United States under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is one way of capturing the burden and the presumption. To justify a law that bears negatively on a person's religious freedom, even if it's a neutral law of general applicability, like the Affordable Care Act, the law must be supported by a compelling state interest and represent the least restrictive or intrusive means of protecting or serving that interest. Now, we can debate as a matter of American constitutional law or as a matter of policy whether it is or should be up to courts or to legislators to decide when exemptions to general neutral laws should be granted for the sake of religious freedom or to determine when the presumption in favor of religious freedom has been overcome. That's what the famous uh, 1991 Peyote case, uh, Oregon against Smith, was about. But the substantive matter of what religious freedom demands from those who exercise the levers of state power, that there should be such a test as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, should be something on which reasonable people of goodwill across the religious and political spectrums should agree on. And indeed, we did all agree on it in 1992 and 1993. The consensus has only collapsed in recent years because of the desire to promote ideologies associated with same-sex marriage and issues related to that, and abortion. So people who were favoring those causes didn't want people who were opposed to them to be able to act on their own faith in the carrying out of their professions and businesses and so forth. But I think we need to get that consensus back. And if we can't, we must nevertheless fight with all our might in favor of religious freedom, because it's a matter not only of religious faith, but of reason and the common good. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. My name is Hiram Shumway. I'm a master's student in microbiology. Oh. Thanks so much for coming out. 
Um, I had a question for you about um, Eastern Europe closing their borders to, to Muslims um, in, in the recent attacks on, on Brussels. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on the matter and if we'll see Europe be um, less open to religious minorities in the, in the future, especially in the time frame of like two to three years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, question. I am not speaking uh, tonight in my capacity. Uh, Richard kindly introduced me as, among other things, the chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. And I'm not speaking in my capacity as uh, chairman or as a member of the commission this evening. But what I know about the subject you've asked, basically, I've learned from my experience on the commission, where we've been very much involved uh, with the refugee issue, among uh, other issues. And our commission, with my full support, has actually favored an expansion of the number of refugees that we in our own country should take. That's not a popular position, certainly not a popular position with my fellow uh, conservatives, but it's one that I believe in that our commission uh, unanimously, uh, no, I'm wrong, it's not unanimous, but our commission by majority uh, has, uh, has agreed to. Uh, Europe is a very interesting and a much more difficult uh, case. Uh, to be very, very honest with you, I think that uh, the Europeans have mismanaged. Uh, not, not because of the uh, errors on the part of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. I, I, I think that uh, Dr. Gonzalez actually is uh, one of the heroes in the story and has done a good job, although he's now uh, uh, moved on and we have a new High Commissioner. But I think that the individual nations simply did not do a good job. Now, it was going to be difficult to do a good job because of the crazy nature of the, of the circumstances. People arriving in boats on the islands in the Mediterranean, including uh, Sicily and other, and other places. Uh, the, the huge flow, just the sheer number of refugees, the, the, the great caravan of refugees uh, moving up through uh, Eastern Europe and into parts of Western Europe, such as, uh, such as Germany, made it very, very difficult. But it was not it was not managed well. Uh, uh, many Europeans, I think, wanted to do their best in the circumstances of a, a humanitarian catastrophe. And the nature of the catastrophe made the situation very, very desperate. But order was never actually effectively imposed on the system. And that created a lot of problems, in, including the problem of uh, ill-motivated people insinuating themselves into the ranks of the refugees, which is what people do fundamentally fear. And now with the ISIS terrorist attacks occurring outside the Middle East, in Paris and in Brussels, and um, I know of nobody who believes that <clears throat> Brussels is going to be the last terrorist attack in Europe. So hate to say that, but there it is. I think with these attacks, there's going to be a great deal more skepticism among the European populations, and not just the Eastern European populations, about accepting refugees. And that's understandable. Um, I fear the rise of political parties that are uh, not only nationalistic, but um, um, xenophobic, uh, that are uh, racist. Um, the, 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 the evidence seems to be piling up that anti-refugee and anti-immigrant parties are doing better across Europe and even in England. UKIP in England has, uh, has emerged. Uh, I, I don't want to go through the individual parties and say what I, what I, what I think of them. I mean, uh, I, I think some of them show signs of getting very dangerous, uh, but uh, now is not the time for, uh, for uh, calling out the individual parties. But there's a trend. And I don't like the direction of the, uh, of the trend. But I think in view of the catastrophe with the mismanagement of the refugee flow over the course of the past uh, many months, the European populations are simply going to harden themselves. The, 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 the sexual assaults and rapes in Germany, in Cologne and in other cities, have had a very bad effect uh, on people, not just in Germany. It's frightened people. It's frightened a lot of women. Uh, people are very worried about the people coming in from cultures that are very different uh, in situations that there's not effective control. Uh, and that's going to have political consequences. It inevitably, that kind of thing inevitably has political consequences. So uh, my, my answer to your question is that I'm not optimistic. I would like to see Europe and the United States handle the refugee question or, or catastrophe, the humanitarian disaster, in a way that 
my great-grandchildren would someday be proud of. And I now don't think that that's going to happen, at least not in, not in Europe. Now, the situation in the United States is very, very different. For refugees to get into the United States, the hurdles are much, much higher than they were to get into the European countries. Our security system is much, much better. And on top of that, there are these vast, there's a vast ocean, which means that people can't just come here in boats and then what are we going to do with them? We can't send them back in boats. We've had, we've had boat people before, but that was from Cuba, 90 miles off the coast of Florida. So I don't think we're going to have the situation that we, here in the United States that we have in Europe, which is part of why I would like to, to take advantage of our better situation and welcome more refugees here. I know that there are church communities. I don't doubt that there are LDS people. There are certainly Catholics and Baptists and members of many other faiths who would welcome refugee families in their, uh, in their uh, communities, including their church communities and sometimes in their, in their own homes. Uh, but for that to happen, we need to be, be willing as a, uh, as a political matter to, to welcome refugees here. So I, I would like to see the number increased. I don't think that we would put our security in any grave jeopardy by increasing the number in a, in a reasonable and responsible way. Yeah. So I think uh, one of the important questions in contemporary political thought today is, how decisive religious reasons should be in making policy. There is a position that is articulated by John Rawls and others that says that citizens in a liberal democracy um, shouldn't advocate a policy for exclusively religious reasons unless there's a secular rationale for the policy. And I think the idea behind this position is that everyone uh, is entitled to respect Thus, if we're going to pass coercive laws, they ought to be justified to the people being coerced. And because we live in a pluralistic society, there are going to be secular persons or irreligious persons, and thus the laws need to be justified to them. Consequentially, there must be a secular reason undergirding the policy, the coercive policy. So I want to know what you think about the argument and the position uh, okay. in general. My critique of that whole uh, approach, and including Professor Rawls's uh, articulation of the approach uh, in his 1993 book, uh, Political Liberalism, is in chapter four of my book, The Clash of Orthodoxies. And then I developed the argument uh, in some other places, including in a, in a paper I have called The Concept of uh, Public Morality. So what I can say here in response to the question is just a little tidbit, and I would uh, invite you, if you're interested in the question at all, and in what someone from my perspective, from a natural law point of view, would say against the Rawlsian position, you can begin with that, uh, with that chapter. Um, uh, I don't think it works at all. In fact, I think it's a spectacular uh, failure. Uh, Rawls labored mightily uh, in political liberalism. Uh, and then after that, in the uh, uh, preface uh, to the paperback edition two years later in 1995 uh, of political liberalism, and then a few years later in an article that he published in the um, University of Chicago Law Review uh, on the nature of public reasons. To draw, to find a way to draw a principled ground between a public reason and a non-public reason. Having conceded as he must that uh, uh, many reasons that he would like to exclude, including some religious reasons, uh, would he, he would like to exclude as valid reasons for political action, at least in uh, circumstances where we're talking about constitutional essentials and matters of basic justice. Many of those reasons could not be categorized as purely private reasons. So the distinction is not between public and private reasons. Rawls admits that some of the reasons he wants to exclude are not private reasons, but he wants to call them non-public reasons, that is, reasons that, albeit not private, don't qualify as public reasons under his theory. Now, he tried to find a principled way for drawing the line between the public and the non-public, and he simply couldn't do it. And he gets hammered by critics, and so he comes back in the preface to the, to the paperback edition with a new uh, approach or a revised approach or an effort. That doesn't work. He comes back in the Harvard, uh, in the University of Chicago Law Review uh, piece, and, and, and that doesn't work either. And I think that the reason for that is he always has to end up smuggling in his own set of non-public reasons to 
uh, make out his case for public reason in the first place. And where this becomes most clear that it's happening, it's where it's clearest that it's happening, is in the famous footnote on abortion in the original version, the 1993 book, Political Liberalism, where he says that uh, on a proper understanding of public reason, abortion would have to be permitted uh, legal within the, under the, uh, uh, during the first three trimesters. Now, why there? He doesn't tell us. And perhaps longer. So he looks like what he's trying to do is, is, is come up with a philosophical defense of Roe versus Wade. But why on earth should we believe that? I mean, there's overwhelming scientific evidence that the child in the womb, or if you prefer, the fetus, is the same entity at four months or seven months or a year and a half is the same entity at those stages that it is uh, on the second day or the first day or from the earliest embryonic stage. In fact, it's the same being, the same living member of the species Homo sapiens that will perhaps live for another 90 years. There's no what philosophers call substantial change between that being and the 90-year-old uh, 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 being, uh, human being. So you have this question of who gets to count as a member of the community whose rights are protected by the doctrine of public reason. It's not clear that you can use a Rawlsian public reason analysis to figure out whether the unborn are in or not. What about the seriously cognitively disabled that Peter Singer would exclude? Are they in or not? What about dolphins or monkeys? that Peter Singer would include. Are they in or not? What about people in suffering from dementias or in advanced Alzheimer conditions? Are they in or not? And nothing in the theory of public reason will tell you whether they're in or not. What's doing the work in Rawls's analysis, those who are three months or older are in, those who are three months or younger are not in, has got to be some, by Rawls's own account, non-public reason. So it can't pass his own test. Now, eventually, he finally, I guess it's in the Chicago, he finally kind of throws his hands up in the air on the issue and says, well, uh, I wasn't actually making an argument there. I was just stating an opinion. Well, that can't be right. The whole point was to illustrate in a concrete case something that Professor Rawls, for whom I have enormous respect, by the way, something that Professor Rawls was notorious for rarely doing, providing an actual concrete example. If you look at the whole of a theory of justice, there are very few. If you look at po political liberalism, there are very few. But he finally gives us one. It's the case of abortion, and it's an utter failure. So that, that's a little pricey of the, of the longer uh, argument that I make in Chapter 4 of Clash. Well, thank you. Thanks. We need to move ahead. If these questions are real short, uh, we'll take the these last three quickly. The problem is not the questions. Yeah. It's my answers. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> you were thinking it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you for being here, Professor. Um, my question is very similar, actually, to the last one. Um, it's more concrete, I suppose. Um, we have a lot of different religious, overtly religious, and in many instances, specifically Judeo-Christian uh, um, things about our society that our government puts out, such as our money, which has, in God we trust, and in some public places, the Ten Commandments, and the Pledge of Allegiance contains a reference to God, and, and other things, too. Um, and I wonder how, in your opinion, um, the defensibility of such things is given the injunction in the Constitution against the establishment of religion. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, yeah. One thing to remember is we, what we have in this country are lots of different religions, but we, what we have more fundamentally or more comprehensively are lots of different worldviews, some of which are religious and some of which are not. And what we need is a way of treating all worldviews fairly, not just all religions. And that means that none can be given preference, including liberal secularism. It cannot be given preference because it's a worldview that competes with us. It may pretend to a position of neutrality. It's by the neutral playing field or an umpire just calling the balls and strikes. But it's more like a pitcher pretending to be the umpire, calling his own balls and strikes, and guess what? Every batter struck out on three pitches. How did that happen? <laughs> so we can't let liberal secularism get away with claiming that it's some neutral position that's just adjudicating among uh, the others, providing a fair, pl fair playing ground for the competition uh, of, the, uh, of the others. It's in the game. It's a competitor, and it shouldn't be given any, 
any favoritism over any others. Now, actually, you want to know what the Establishment Clause really means? I'll tell you what the Establishment Clause really means. Remember the words, first of all, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, that's been interpreted in one of two ways, I'm sorry, in two different ways, both of which are wrong. One of them is to claim that, well, by Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, and not just saying Congress shall make no law establishing a religion, which would have a clear meaning. The additional words respecting and means that Congress can't have anything to do with religion, law can't have anything to do with religion, it can't disfavor religion, but it can't favor religion. It's got to be neutral not only as among the different religions, but also between religion and hostility to religion, or irreligion, or how, whatever you want to count as the uh, counterpoint to religion. That's sometimes called um, strict separationism. Uh, now, the alternative, which I think is more credible but still wrong, is the belief that the words respecting and don't mean that, that the government can do nothing, even in an even-handed way, to favor religion. Uh, it means only that government must be even-handed in its treatment of the different religions. So if it makes public funds available uh, for uh, Catholic schools, say for the non-religious aspects of teaching in Catholic schools, textbooks for history and math and English literature, then it's got to be willing to make the same accommodation, provide the same support for Lutheran schools or Jewish day schools or Buddhist schools or what have you. Okay? That's sometimes called non-preferentialism. So the two big contenders are non-preferentialism and strict separationism. Neither can actually do justice to those words respecting and. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So what do the words mean? I'll tell you what they mean. And it will be absolutely clear to you if you consider that the states had established religions all the way into the 1830s. And those establishments of religion didn't, well, not all the states did, but several of the states did, depending on which count as an establishment. A majority actually did. And they didn't die out until the 1930s. And then... They weren't, they weren't struck down as unconstitutional. They were gotten rid of legislatively or just fell into disuetude. Um, the, the Bill of Rights was appended in order to reinforce the delegated powers doctrine of the original Constitution, the idea that the federal government is a government of delegated and enumerated powers. But some people thought that wasn't good enough. We needed a Bill of Rights. Some of the anti-federalists in particular thought that we needed a Bill of Rights. They weren't too keen on the Constitution itself to begin with. But it was clear that the Bill of Rights applied to the national government. Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say states shall make. It said Congress shall make no law. So the states could have established religions. But more than that, the states were protected in their established religions. The established religions of the states were protected. The states were protected in their right to have establishments of religion by that very language. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What that meant, is it was a straightforward, concise statement that Congress can neither establish a national church that will compete with the religions in the states, nor disestablish the state churches, or interfere with them, or tax them, or anything like that. Congress shall make no law respecting and. I've actually looked it up. In the 18th century, the word respecting and the words respecting and meant just what they mean today, having to do with touching upon, regarding. Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion, having to do with an establishment of religion. You can't establish a national one. You can't disestablish or tax or interfere with the state ones. And to see that that's true, you can just do a little thought experiment. Imagine that you are, uh, C C Connecticut was a state with an established religion. I think it was the Congregational Church. I could be wrong about that. Anyway, imagine it is the Congregational Church. You're the Solicitor General for Connecticut. Let's say the national government, once the Jeffersonians get power in 1800, uh, the Jeffersonians are now in power, and they enact a bill purporting to disestablish the Church of Connecticut. Now, you're before the Supreme Court as the Solicitor General for Connecticut, and you're having to defend your state's establishment. You're going to argue that the Congress doesn't, isn't entitled to, it's unconstitutional for Congress to pass a law disestablishing the state religion in Connecticut, the Congregational Church of Connecticut. 
what are you going to argue? You're going to argue two things, and they're both knockdown arguments, by the way. First, you're going to argue this law is unconstitutional because Congress has been delegated no power. Article 2, Section 8, nowhere else in the Constitution has Congress been delegated a power to disestablish churches in the states. That's your first argument. But your second argument is going to be, and I've got some textual support on my side, too. I don't have to simply refer to the, to the doctrine of delegated powers, to the theory of the Constitution, or the theory of the powers of the national government under the Constitution. I can cite you some chapter and verse, and it's called the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And this law, disestablishing the Church of Connecticut, or purporting to do so, is a law respecting an establishment of religion, namely ours, namely the establishment of the Congregational Church in Connecticut, and you would have won. So there's what it means. Thank you. So Dr. Yes, Dr. George, my question is, it seems like your argument is based on the fact that there's a good, a, an intrinsic human good of religion that then the right of religion is, is directed to protect. So my question is, how would you distinguish that from those who might argue, well, the good of religion when the, and that right is essentially the good of philosophy or the right to philosophize and try to come to senses with the universe around me. Like Plato, for instance, yeah. you know, he's trying to find the ultimate good, the ultimate truth, and, and he seems to turn that philosophy. So I could see some people arguing, well, essentially this is an argument for the right to philosophy. How would you distinguish this good of religion and the good of philosophy and those two rights? Well, I'm a typical Catholic, so I don't distinguish philosophy and religion very sharply. And I think it was Alfred North Whitehead, who was not a Catholic, who said that in the whole of human history, it's hard to find a more religious person than Socrates. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Mark Gelman, uh, with whom I was talking about the difficulty of distinguishing philosophies from religion and sometimes trying to figure out whether something is a philosophy or is a religion. And Rabbi Gelman's a very practical man. And so he said to me, a more abstract sort of a guy, he said, it's really quite easy. If there are prayers and candles, it's a religion. If not, it's a philosophy. He's <laughs> probably right about that, by the way. But I think that the key thing is, are you, whether you're going to call it a philosophy or a religion, and religions include massive doses of, tend to include massive doses of philosophy. And that's not just Catholicism. That's Hinduism. That's Buddhism. Lots of religions are, are, are communities and institutions that sort of incorporate, as that text from the Vatican Council said in speaking about uh, Hinduism, the precise insights of philosophy. So if it's a philosophy that is directed toward the great existential questions of God, the gods, whether there is a more than merely human, a transcendent source of meaning and value, how we should line our, li selves, our lives up uh, to be in harmony with and friendship with the more than merely human sources of meaning and value, if there be such, well, then that's, that's, that works for me. That's protected under the right to, whether you call it a philosophy or religion, to me is not relevant. It's protected by the right to what I'm going to call religious freedom. In our international documents now, often we call this right the right to religion, uh, the right to freedom of religion or belief, and it's a kind of nod in that direction. But I don't think it's even necessary. To, I mean, I'm happy to do that if it makes people feel better. But I don't think it's actually necessary to do that. I think people understand what I'm saying when I say that the right to religious freedom protects Camus. If the right to religious freedom protects Camus, who was not a believer, then the good that it's protecting is the good that Camus was seeking just as you and I seek it. And that's what matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Dr. George, thank you for being here. Thank you.